then we can continue with the last talk or the last formal talk of this uh, the summer school. And now we go even one step further and it's like almost like the final step that you can go with VPH technologies and with modeling and combining it with information and data and data analysis. And that's going towards use it for, for example, surgery, for surgery planning, for doing the experiments. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Mikel Angel Gonzalez Ballester, who is also working here at the UPF. He's also an ICREA research professor here in Catalonia. And he's working together with us, like in a whole set of groups where Oscar and me are focusing mostly on the cardiovascular application and Michael Angel is doing all the rest and is doing it much better than us. So we are looking forward to hearing your talk, Michael Angel. Thanks very much. Uh, so I, I always joke saying that there is a, a very strong group on, on brain analysis here in the university, a very strong group with heart analysis here with uh, Oscar and Bart. And I'm the person without a brain and without a heart that works on the rest, yeah. which is not true because actually I also the neuro things and cardiac things. Um, when, when I looked a bit at the, um, the program of the, of the summer school, which I think is great, we had some really, really good uh, speakers, um, I tried to think about how to focus my talk. Uh, because we've seen a lot of work or a lot of presentations on, on imaging, on image processing, on modeling for like um, understanding the basic workings of physiology, on modeling for also patient-specific diagnosis and prediction. Um, but then I want to give a bit the, the complementary view of, um, okay, once you've done all this analysis and you want to treat the patient, what sort of technologies or what, what sort of approaches can we do? Yeah. Um, also, um, instead of focusing the presentation on uh, talking about my research, I structured it more like a lecture, okay? So we will go through some of the basic things that I, I think are fundamentally different from what we've seen up to now, and maybe focus on three main things. One is navigation technology, so things that you can implement to help the surgeon or to guide the surgeon in the operating room to reproduce the plan that he or she has done prior to the surgery. The other is intraoperative imaging that can help you complement the information that you have during the intervention, and the other is surgical robotics. Okay. So there will be two main take-home messages in, in what you will see. One is this, so the basic idea of computer-assisted surgery, the basic elements, etc. And the other is the, the need to think out of the box, okay. which I think we, we've seen in the previous uh, presentations as well. Okay. But um, when you go into a lab, there is always a tendency that you continue the work or the lines of work that are in the lab. Okay? But I, I always try to, um, to expose students from the beginning to the application, to get them to talk to the surgeons or to the doctors or whatever, and come up with their own crazy ideas before giving them a sort of route of what they should implement. Okay? So I think this is also very important. So to, to think about um, what is your view and to have some sort of scientific, uh, let's say science fiction type of uh, ideas uh, that maybe are not feasible nowadays, but they will in the future. So um, focusing on treatment, of course, not all treatments are based on surgery. There are a lot of treatments that don't involve any type of surgical intervention. Um, but to think a bit about um, what should be the future of surgery, maybe I will divagate a, a little bit uh, focusing on what is the past of surgery first and to give um, a sort of brief overview of the whole process that has taken us to the, the current setup in the operating rooms. Of course, anciently, uh, 7,000 years ago, um, there were some very basic uh, interventions that are documented that were al already done in prehistoric times and then later in, in Egypt and, and then later on in, uh, in Greece, in Rome, etc. So there is a long history of documentation of surgical procedures, but until like the mid 19th century, nobody thought really about antiseptic uh, aspects of the surgery. So nobody thought about washing your hands or washing the instruments basically before. Yeah? So think that um, the whole pro progress that has been going on in surgery is fairly recent. 
and things that we um, nowadays think, okay, so this is crazy. These guys were doing things without any safety. Um, so probably people in a hundred years from now will think about the way we do surgery and think that we are crazy and we're doing some really silly things. Yeah? Um, anyway, so coming a bit more to, to practical things. So the, the recent past of surgery has been hugely influenced by the advent of, of imaging technology. And since Philips is in the room, so we, we should acknowledge also that part of this is, uh, is of course, thanks to Philips and other manufacturers. Um, but so where should we go from now? Okay. And there are, if you look around a bit, just out in the internet, whatever, there are, there are different views where people have seen uh, we should go from now. Yeah? One is, of course, the integration of robotics. So having more and more automated treatments, um, robots that operate on the patient, or more than robots, tools that operate on the patient. Um, part of this is already there, so we have some surgical robots that are in the market and we will see some, some examples. Um, another idea is the idea to incorporate information in the operating room. So have not only the patient laying there and being locked in the room, but actually have access to a lot of external information as well, yeah? and to integrate all these. Yeah? So of course this is also things that are happening and this is the whole concept of the digital operating room. So there's a big community and led by many manufacturers um, that are trying to integrate all the devices and have connected operating rooms and uh, these sort of things. Um, what else? Well, new ways of interacting with, with things it's from a movie and these are some prototypes that people use with the Kinect and things like that to, to, uh, to access the data or more uh, robotic uh, systems that operate in the, uh, in the patient, yeah. And in particular, this robot is from a movie, but it's also a prototype that is actually used in, in experimental surgery and was developed by a university. Okay. What else? Um, we have also the concept of like, um, let's say, um, things that require less intervention. Okay. So now the, the concept of surgery is about opening the patient and doing things, right? Is this going to change? I think it is. And, and, and in fact, there has been a lot of uh, ideas about how to operate from inside or how to have, how to have devices that cure the patient with, without being so invasive. And this relates a lot with the concept of nanotechnology. And maybe some years from now, people will think that we are doing all this blood and all these cuts for nothing, right? In any case, the situation in which we are now is that we are dealing with surgeons, of course, and we have to provide tools to them to be able to guide or to be able to uh, help them perform the surgery, okay? This also involves the need for being fault uh, tolerant and to kind of monitor what's going on in the operating room and be able to integrate all this. Okay, anyway, so the, the first block that I wanted to discuss was about surgical navigation. The idea of surgical navigation is, of course, uh, well, it's very similar to car navigation. Okay, you, you want to go somewhere, um, you have made a sort of route, a plan, and um, you want to have some external device or some system that is able to guide you to the location or to the anatomical or pathological structure where you want to go. So what sort of technologies or what sort of devices have people thought of and have implemented in, in routine? Um, from the past, again, so just briefly to give the, the perspective, the, the first idea was uh, this stereotactic frame uh, concept that was used in neurosurgery and was just uh, a fixed frame that was attached to the, to the skull of the, of the patient. Okay. So the frame was attached with, with some screws. Right. And then it was used to guide electrodes into the brain of the patient. Okay. So what do we gain from this? We gain having some sort of reference system. So it defines a Cartesian space in which you can relate positions and you can say, okay, so, so many uh, millimeters in this direction, so many in this other. Um, this is still used, in fact, and this is a modern version of the stereotactic frame. 
but uh, some, some of the main limitations that um, led to further development, and in fact the most crucial uh, flaw of the system, was that it was assuming that the anatomy inside is more or less constant. Okay. So it was assuming that if, we, if you move three millimeters from here and five millimeters from there in this direction, you should aim the, to, to find the brain ventricles, for example. Um, obviously, especially for pathological cases, this is not the case. There is quite a lot of variability. And uh, it was not until much later when we had better imaging equipment that we were able to integrate 3D imaging and 3D information and more, uh, let's say, meaningful coordinates to guide the operation. Um, this is a, a picture from Hansfield, who invented, as you know, the CT scanner. Um, and well, this is why this whole field started to develop in the, in the 90s, basically, um, towards more integrating the 3D imaging and having more computing power uh, to, to guide the surgeon. And the first development that was, let's say, commonplace was the use of articulated arms, which are these sort of things, okay, where you have a tool and you had a set of articulations. And if you have studied robotics and, and you, you maybe are familiar with the whole concept of having several articulations and doing the inverse problem to be able to guide to a particular location, etc. In this case, this, this was a, a sort of passive robot, so it didn't have any, any autonomous movement of the, of the articulations, but it was able to compute what is exactly the 3D location of the tip relative to the reference. Okay. So if you had some 3D data of the patient and you were aligning through a calibration process this 3D data to the origin of this tool, and if the anatomy of the patient doesn't change while you are doing things to, to him or her, then this gives you a reference frame, basically. And this is still somehow in use. Okay, um, this is a more modern navigation system. Um, what we have normally is that we have some preoperative images. They can be CT, MRI, whatever you have that you have used to diagnose the patient, to plan the intervention. From these preoperative images, uh, you can have also some preoperative plan, and there is a whole field on how to do interfaces to plan interventions and to plan trajectories, etc., in a way that is uh, useful for the surgeon. Um, and this can be shown in, in these displays. You have then also devices that are able to do tracking. And tracking in this case, in this device, would be this camera here. Um, which is basically like an eye that is looking at the scene and is able to track what's going on. So what is actually the surgeon doing? Where is the patient? If there has been any sort of uh, variations in terms of relative positions of the tools, of the patient, etc. And we will very briefly explain the basic workings of how optical tracking and electromagnetic tracking uh, work. And what's very important is that we have many different coordinate systems. So we have the coordinate system of the preoperative image, and this can be many different coordinate systems because we, we need to align all the preoperative images, as you know, by image registration. Um, but then also we need to uh, align all the preoperative data to the patient because the patient is lying there on the, on the bed. Yep. Uh, and this concept is also known as registration, it's patient registration, and there are quite a lot of ways of doing it. But the basic idea is that yeah, you have your images somewhere and you put them on the patient. So you're able to work on the same 3D space. So the camera is measuring 3D positions in the patient, and these 3D positions, they can be related to the image. That's a bit the idea. So this is an illustration from a very early navigation system. It's from the 90s and it was developed by the, the group where well, I worked for several years in, in Bern. And it was the first system that was doing navigated uh, spine surgery. Um, so you would have some preoperative data of the patient and this data was shown in this, in this display. Um, you would have also the camera, that is the tracking system that was looking at the scene. So it was looking at all the instruments. And you can see that there are some small devices here which are sensors that are looked by the camera. So they can be 
located and the 3D position of these things can be uh, found. And these sensors are attached to the anatomy, so to the spine, and this is the tool of the patient that has also some sensors, so the 3D positions can be related. And the basic idea is that then you can map the tool on the image. So as the surgeon is doing things, he is able to see uh, what is at the tip of the tool, even if he cannot have a direct view of the, of the anatomy inside. Okay. So that's the basic idea. If you cannot look inside directly, thanks to this, uh, you can have access to the full uh, 3D information and you can navigate the tip of the tool. Okay, in terms of technologies that have been developed for tracking, and, and that's something that if you, if you work on this field or if you collaborate through your work with some people that are doing uh, intraoperative navigation, uh, there are a number of choices in terms of the available technologies. So you have, of course, articulated arms. It's an, an expensive option. Some early technologies that were tried were also based on ultrasound, so 1D ultrasound probes just to locate uh, positions of points. Um, electromagnetic tracking, which we will briefly discuss later. Optical tracking, and there, there are a number of choices, and we will see now as well. Or things like structured light, or patterns of light that you project on the patient, and then you are able to reconstruct the 3D shape based only on this uh, projected light. So there are a number of technologies that are used to be able to track uh, the movements of the tools and the patient. In terms of optical tracking, which is probably the most common uh, nowadays, uh, what you have is a, a, a camera or a set of cameras. In this case, this device has two cameras that are in a certain configuration that is well calibrated and controlled. And you have tools where you need to attach some thing that has to be seen by the camera. Um, you have two types, active optical tracking in which is this configuration here. You have LEDs that are emitting light on the tool. Okay. And these LEDs, they emit light and the light is seen by the camera. And this allows to be able to track the, the tool. Uh, however, they need some power source. So either a local battery or some cables, etc. Uh, the accuracy is better though. Then you have passive uh, tracking in which you have some coated markers. So you have some reflective balls and there is light that is emitted by the camera and reflected. So these are less expensive, but also they are less accurate in, in terms of uh, tracking accuracy. The problem with optical tracking is, of course, that you need direct line of sight. So if the surgeon gets in the middle between the camera and the tool, or if you want to, um, to reach a certain location uh, that is inside the body where the the sensors cannot be seen, then this poses uh, quite a lot of problems and you are not able to do tracking. In any case, as I said, this is the most common uh, technology and it's, for example, in some of the integrated operating rooms of Brain Lab in this case or in some other surgeries, you can see the camera hanging from the ceiling and, and looking at the scene. It's a bit like a tennis referee type of thing. Um, one thing uh, maybe to mention is that uh, for every different tool that you want to use, what they do is they have a different configuration of the markers, so they are identifiable. So if you, if you look at the pattern of the shape of these balls, you are able to identify which tool it is. And also the idea of tool calibration. Tool calibration means that you have a CAD model or you have a computational model of how is the tool. So it, the camera only sees the balls. So you need to somehow calibrate and be able to tell where is the tip exactly relative to the balls or what is the shape of the tool, basically. And that is what is known as, as tool calibration. Um, to track the patient, uh, there are, it depends a lot on the, on the type of intervention, of course. Uh, just to illustrate, so for example, for orthopedic interventions, it is quite common that the, the, the use of a dynamic reference base. A dynamic reference base is the same type of sensor. In this case, it is an active uh, uh, marker. So you have the LEDs here emitting, and it is rigidly attached to the anatomy. So if the patient moves, 
you can track the location of, of the patient. Um, and this is in fact one of the main uh, limitations nowadays of these systems, even though they are quite used uh, commonly. Uh, for example, for orthopedic interventions, you are requested to um, attach these markers rigidly to the bones that you want to track. So if you want to track what is the flexion of the, of the knee in this case, or you want to uh, track the movements, so, so all the, the plan moves together with the patient, then you need to invasively um, attach these DRBs to the bones. And the attachment is, is quite important, so this is a practical thing, it's nothing really fundamental scientifically, but if you kind of kick the, the marker during the intervention, which is something that happens quite often, and it's not rigidly attached, then the system will think that the whole anatomy has changed. Okay. So you will need to recalibrate and redo the, the, the whole planning, let's say, uh, or update the, the whole planning uh, during the intervention. Okay, the other, the other technology that I mentioned, apart from optical tracking, is electromagnetic tracking. In this case, this is based on generating uh, an, a magnetic field through a field generator. And then this magnetic field is in a way that uh, your tools can be located in 3D. So without going into detail, but it generates a field and you can imagine that the sensor locally or the tool is able to read the value of this field and through triangulation and things be able to locate the 3D position. Um, of course, the good thing of this is that it doesn't need any direct line of sight. So you can use it, for example, at the tip of the endoscopes. So you can put one of these sensors at the tip of the endoscope and even if the endoscope is inside the anatomy of the patient and it cannot be seen directly by the, by the eyes, the 3D position can be tracked anyway. The, the cons of this technology is that it's sensitive to the presence of metallic or ferromagnetic uh, objects. So, so, of course, you need to control a lot the type of instruments that you use uh, for these interventions. Okay, so that was the first part. So, um, this idea of tracking systems or, or navigation systems and how you are uh, monitoring the intervention. Um, the other concept that I wanted to throw during this talk was um, mention a few, um, a few types of interoperative imaging that are used in computer-assisted surgery and some example systems. Um, of course, one of the most common is X-ray fluoroscopy. So, uh, as you know, fluoroscopy is continuous X-ray exposure, so you have dynamic sequences. It's used a lot for um, orthopedic interventions, it's used a lot for catheter interventions in, in vessels, stenting, things like this. Um, in this case, for the use in navigation, it's very important to calibrate or to take into account the exact configuration of the X-ray machine, so where is the source, where is the sensor, uh, to be able to um, interpret the images, so to be able to um, let's say, calibrate the dimensions of the images. So if you measure three pixels, how many millimeters this is, basically. And there are a number of uh, procedures um, that have been used or um, that have been devised to, to be able to calibrate this in, in very uh, non-invasive uh, ways, let's say. Um, of course, nowadays, with the, the use of advanced uh, C-arms, you are able to, to have continuous 2D fluoroscopy, but also by doing a full rotation, you are able to have combeam uh, CT scans, uh, which give you a full 3D image of very good quality, and you can relate this 3D image with the 2D projections. And this can be done in a number of ways. For example, here, this is work uh, that, that is done in, in our group by uh, Chong Zhang. Um, that is, um, so registering or maintaining the, the, the correspondence updated all the time between the 3D data set, which is a preoperative CT, but it can be also an intraoperative uh, combium CT, and the continuous uh, 2D projections through fluoroscopy to be able to guide um, interventions of abdominal aortic aneurysms. Other, uh, other modalities that are commonly used in, in navigated surgery, uh, ultrasound, of course, because it is cheap, uh, it is non-radiating, and it's available in, in most hospitals. 
Uh, this is, for example, work uh, on uh, guiding uh, radiofrequency ablation of the, of the liver uh, with the help of the, the VO ultrasound. So you can illustrate or you can imagine what is the basic idea here. So you're monitoring the, the, the intervention and you're tracking the, the position of the, of the tip of the, of the probe. This is another example, and, and in fact, is from, from work that was going on in, in INRIA when, when we both were working in INRIA. Was that like 15 years ago? <laughs> okay. and, and in this case, it's for neurosurgery, um, where the idea was to have a robot doing the, the surgery, and you would have a preoperative MRI where you are able to plan the intervention, so to see, analyze where is the tumor or where, where you want to go and exactly what you want to do with the patient, and then have intraoperatively um, ultrasound scans. So this is possible because the, there, is, there is a window uh, that is close to the, to the ear where you can have quite good um, ultrasound images during the intervention. And the whole process was defined as a, as a problem of registration, basically, because you would have many ultrasound images, you would be continuously monitoring the intervention, but you would have only one MRI volume, and the idea was to fuse this information and be able to keep updated the, the, the location of the, of the tool relative to the MRI. And to do this, well, we thought of some, some methods for registration. This would be an example of the preoperative MRI, the ultrasound image, it's a 3D ultrasound. And this would be the result after registration and the overlay of the gradient of the MRI on the ultrasound. So to just monitor if the registration was correct. Okay, what else? So apart from fluoroscopy and ultrasound, I also mentioned that there are quite a number of uh, interventions that are city guided, um, mostly things related to needle biopsies. So you would see the, the needle here and you're able to track if you're actually in the right uh, location. Um, the basic uh, thing is to be able to track if there is some deformation, so if the needle has bent or if the trajectory has been modified relative to the, to the planning. And the same idea also for MRI, so in particular open MRI, as, as you know, or maybe you don't, uh, there are open MRI magnets in which uh, the, the magnetic field is generated by these two donuts here, and you have an area that is open so the surgeon can stand here and operate and, and then he can go back and get a new image and go in and, and it's kind of flexible for uh, interventions. Okay, um, and then there are a number of combined suites uh, that have appeared lately. I, I think we, we mentioned one, the, the one, you mentioned the one of KCL also. Uh, but for example, uh, this is a, a combined operating room in which the, the patient can be moved inside a PET machine or a CT machine and, and the data can be updated. So, so basically, during the intervention, um, the patient can be cleaned, let's say, and then thrown for imaging so we have updated information uh, while we are doing the intervention. Okay, then moving to, to another type of imaging and, and maybe showing some, some more uh, examples of, of things that are more related to, to what we do here. Uh, this is an example for surgical microscopes. And surgical microscopes, of course, they give optical imaging. So you, you see things bigger. Yeah? That's the idea of a microscope. And they are very much used in neurosurgery and also in ENT surgery. So ear, nose, and throat, um, so tumors in the scalp base or endonasal type of tumors, etc. Um, this is a system that we built um, that was uh, incorporating the tracking camera attached to the microscope. And, and in fact, this configuration was um, fundamentally much more accurate than other existing systems because the other systems had the camera outside so that needs that you need to track the, the microscope device as well. In any case, this was, uh, um, this was implemented. We were able to overlay through augmented reality the position of the tumor, for example, inside the patient. This is the mouth, the nose, etc. And the, the access here for the tumor removal was in the nasal. 
and you're able also to overlay through augmented reality also things like the, the CT uh, slice at a particular depth um, relative to the tool position, etc. And this was tested on a, on a number of cases in, in Bern. Um, other things that are coming up quite strongly is, of course, um, the combination of optical imaging with markers such as fluorescent probes that can be in injected in the patient and they go naturally to certain locations that relate to the, to the activity of the tumors. So they fluoresce and, and of course they, they, can, they can provide uh, complementary information to be able to delineate clearly the, the bounds of the tumor and thus update the margins of the, of the removal area that you, you want to, to act upon. Um, similar to microscopy, there is endoscopy, as you know. Uh, endoscopy, the camera is at the tip of a, of a tool. Yeah? So you're looking through a keyhole type of thing. There is uh, rigid endoscopy and also flexible endoscopy. And the idea of this diagram is, again, to stress the importance of keeping track of all the reference systems. Because we have the reference system of the preoperative data, we have the reference system of the patient, um, there is the natural reference system of the camera, the marker that is attached to the, to the endoscope, the position of the tool relative to the marker, etc. And, and I would say that this is in fact one of the things that always goes wrong. <laughs> so there is always something that either because the origins are switched or, or there is some, uh, let's say, bad maintenance of all the transformations that are required. Um, it requires always some debugging. Um, in any case, then there is always, of course, the, um, the calibration of the camera itself. As you know, in the scope cameras, they have a bit of a fish eye type of, uh, of um, optical um, view. Uh, so you need, of course, to calibrate the focal length, the, well, all the, all the parameters of the camera, so you are able to uh, relate, let's say, uh, what you see in the, in the image with the physical dimensions. This gets even more complicated if, if we deal with flexible endoscopes. And, and this is our case because most of our applications uh, use flexible endoscopes. In this case, the camera is at the tip of the, of the endoscope and is this type of camera. There is a channel through which you can put things inside. So you can put tools to remove uh, small polyps and things like that. You can have lasers that burn tissue or, or a number of things. Um, but as you can imagine, this is used, for example, for um, colonoscopies or for abdominal interventions. Um, so there are a, num are a number of uh, very complex processes that go on here. So it's not only just being able to track the tip of the camera, is also being able to monitor the deformation of soft tissue organs. And this is where a lot of modeling and simulation comes into play to, to be able to pro kind of uh, predict what, what are the deformations that are happening and compare them with the visual information that you are acquiring. Um, and these things. So these are some, some examples. So for example, if you have calibrated your camera, you can then also uh, generate virtual views. So in this case, this would be a virtual view of the, of the endoscope inserted in a peak in this case. And you can compare the virtual view or overlay the virtual view with the, the optical view that you have in the endoscope. Um, one thing that we recently developed here at the, at the university, and this is work of Marta Guardiola in collaboration with Oscar as well, um, is the integration, it's basically a new imaging device integrated in the endoscope. So it's based on microwave imaging and we built a system with a number of antennas that are attached at the tip of the endoscope. And these antennas generate and get back signal. And this is able to locally create an image. And this image um, is also related to the dielectric properties of the tissue. So in, in a sense, it's a bit like doing local non-invasive biopsy. Okay. So you are able to, hopefully, uh, once we get all the validation done, uh, you are able to have not only the optical view of what's in the colon, but also to characterize if the tissue that is around is benign or has a certain uh, probability of being uh, cancer. Okay, and then you move and have a patent for this. 
What else? Related to endoscopy and things that we do in, in here in UPF, one of the, of the main lines of work in, in our group is on, is on fetal medicine, in our group and also in, in the group of BART. So, so related to brain development in the fetus, related to cardiac problems in the fetus, and also related to intervention in the fetus. So there are a number of pathologies where the babies have to be acted upon before birth, otherwise they die. Um, for example, in this case, we have a, a case of twin-twin uh, uh, transfusion, which we will mention now. And in this, in this case, we have rigid endoscopes. We may have some monitoring through ultrasound that is looking at the scene, and we want to track everything that is happening to be able to guide the surgeon. Okay. One thing is that the, the whole environment is quite complex. So there is a small room, a lot of people, because the, you need somebody to, to, to use the, the ultrasound machine. You need, of course, the surgeon that is using the, the endoscope, nurses, etc. And um, you want also to integrate all these and provide the information at the right time and with uh, the right accuracy. So in particular, for this case of twin-twin transfusion, what happens is that we want to burn as you will see here, there is a laser that is burning some vessels. This is because in these cases, uh, these are pregnancies of twins, of course, and uh, there are connections in the vessels of the placenta, and then blood is flowing from one baby to the other. And we need to do something to close these connections, otherwise what happens is that one of the babies gets too little and the other gets too much nutrients. And what this means is also that this is bad, of course, for the one that gets too little, but also for the other one, because this deregulates completely the, the way the body is working, and this can cause very severe problems leading to death as well. So this is one of the big uh, projects that we have running in collaboration with the, with the Fetal Medicine Unit here in Barcelona. Um, Okay, so we talked a bit about computer-assisted surgery and navigation. We talked a bit about uh, different uh, intraoperative imaging modalities and how uh, computer-assisted surgery has been used in, in some example projects. And I will close with some considerations about surgical robotics. Okay. Um, you may be familiar with this device. I don't know if you have seen or you have been exposed to, to one of these interventions. Um, so this is the Da Vinci robot. In fact, there is quite a lot of um, controversy as to whether this is a robot or not. Because what happens is that the surgeon sits in a console and they have some very sophisticated joystick type of thing and, uh, and a visualization system that is a 3D uh, view and sort of gives the, the view of the, of the surgery. Um, but it's telemanipulated, so it's not a robot in the, in the sort of uh, conventional sense that you, you would think of it. There are some cases of, of robotics that I think I, I, I just want to throw because they, they give a bit the, the idea of all the, the status or, or of all the, the problems that are related to, to robotics in surgery. There was a system called the Robodoc. Uh, that was quite successful. It was built and sold in, in many places and it was for hip surgery. Okay. So the robot would attach to the femur and to the hip and then it was used to perform the cutting of the, of the femoral neck and to cut the planes and so you would put the implant in the hip in a certain way. Um, what happened with this robot is that it was successful, but then there was a study proving that the stresses that you force on the muscles by having these attachments in the femur were actually damaging the leg. So it's not that the accuracy of the intervention was wrong or anything. It's just that because it's a bulky robot and it has to be attached to the bones and it's putting, putting stresses in, in the surrounding tissue, then this was creating problem. And of course, this means that the company went bust and sort of robotics went down, yeah. This is another example of robotics. This is related to a European project that I'm coordinating on, on cochlear uh, surgery. Um, and this is a robot developed by the University of Bern. Um, and the idea is to have a drilling robot. So this robot is able to uh, basically orient this drill in a certain orientation relative to the patient. Here we have a skull, a cadaveric skull and to drive 
the drill to a certain depth. So in general, it seems quite simple. There is a whole amount of work on doing the planning of the intervention because in cochlear surgery, you want to reach the cochlea and the cochlea is surrounded by structures such as the facial nerve and some other risk structures that you don't want to touch. And it's very, very important to be very precise. So one of the things is that the building of the robot itself was not very difficult. So it's not something that took a lot of time. But actually getting the robot to be in a range of precision that is good enough, that took many years. And this is why we have, for example, a system that is a closed system. So you have the monitoring of all the sensors and everything that is inbuilt in the robot, but also a very, very, very precise camera that is monitoring the scene. And there is a kind of feedback loop between the tracking that gives the camera and the information of the sensors. So to be fully sure that the intervention is reaching exactly the, the, the position that it was planned. Um, well, some considerations about MRI compatible robots, just to mention that there are some robots that need to comply with uh, the way they are built uh, so they can be put close to the magnetic field of an MRI. And you have here, for example, an MRI compatible robot for prostate surgery. I, I think you don't need more explanation on this. And also, similarly, there are city mounted robots, so devices that are thought for intra uh, imaging use, let's say. So these are robots that can be attached somehow to the reference frame of the city. So this provides also a certain um, simpler configuration. So the accuracy of the, of the intervention is, is relative to the image and, and it's, it's quite accurate. This is another example. And maybe to finalize also, the, there was a very interesting concept by a, a company in Israel, which is uh, Muscle Robotics. And it's to have a very, very compact robot. And this is used, for example, for spine surgeries. And what they do is they mount the robot on the bones of the patient. So it has to be, of course, stable enough. But instead of having to track the patient and everything, they put it in a way that it moves with you. So, so all the locations are uh, relative to, to, the, um, to the anatomy that you want to target and not so much tracking all the deformations. Okay, and then this is my last example, I think. So these are some crazy concepts of people that are doing robots, for example, um, for cardiac interventions in the, sh in the shape of a, sp of a snake that would get into your heart and would act upon uh, certain structures inside it. Okay, so summary and, and conclusions. Uh, we, we saw some divagations about the future of surgery and science fiction and things. Uh, we saw also some uh, things about the basic idea of computer-assisted surgery, surgical navigation, uh, historical things about frames and articulated arms, navigation workflow, so preoperative, interoperative tracking, etc. And some of the tracking technologies, optical, electromagnetic, and some examples of navigation in the context of uh, different modalities, so uh, fluoroscopy, ultrasound, um, microscopy, endoscopy, etc. And some considerations about surgical robots. Uh, one of the key things is the whole idea of minimally invasive surgery. So to, to have interventions that need, require little incisions and that can go through small holes because you have an, a, a better understanding of what's below because you have a plan that you did before and you have some tracking that is able to provide you the location of the tools relative to the anatomy without having to open to really see it. And uh, in terms of future direct directions or current limitations, um, it is quite obvious that nowadays tracking technologies is still too bulky. So you need to still attach a lot of markers to the anatomy and, and attach bones to the cranium to, to have some fiducials, things like this. Um, the use of predictive models uh, or maybe not, not so much in terms of models, but the, the need to have some way to update the information that we have preoperatively, that is given by the preoperative images, the preoperative plan, etc., to be able to update it relative to what we are doing. So if we are removing tissue from a tumor or something like that, to be able to have a plan that is updated relative to what we did and not just the preoperative plan that doesn't take that into account. 
And then, well, in general, uh, this type of technology is currently available in many hospitals, but still there is a lack of uh, strong, conclusive results proving the cost effectiveness. So proving the improvement that you get in the treatment of patients when you use this technology relative to not using it and uh, the analysis of, of cost. Um, and this is quite a big debate because people say, okay, these systems are expensive, but if they save operating room time, uh, which is the highest cost in the hospital, as you would know, then actually it's cheaper if you use them, if you save certain time in the operating room. And then, well, in terms of surgical robotics, it's just not mature enough, and there, are, there is a lot of, the, of development, but as many people, people would agree, this is a bit the future, so it will come, uh, maybe not today. But. And that was me, that was the presentation. Thank you very much. So I think this was very complimentary to what we have been hearing today. And maybe when you hear your talk, you might wonder a little bit, like especially when you do surgical robotics, which is now the major field of research, because it lo all this looks like mechanics, electronics, and things like that. Is that a bottleneck, or is it more, for example, the image processing side, or is it more the models that we need in order to do soft tissue, or planning, or whatever? Where are the current bottlenecks and where are the, the, the kind of um, research questions now, the burning questions going on? Yeah, yeah. This, uh, I mean, I, I try to focus on the complementary aspects. So obviously in, in, in our group what we have is we have image analysis, we have modeling and simulation, and we have navigation as well. And, and the group involves Gemma, Jerome, and, and I. Yeah. Um, and we focus on, on concrete clinical questions, so we need to target all of that to be able to, to reach a practical system. In particular for robotics, um, a bit the tendency is to develop me mechatronic devices. That's a bit the, the hip uh, uh, term nowadays. So to be able to integrate sensors and actuators on tools that the surgeons are used to use. So if you come with your, whatever, your KUKA robot or something and, and it's there and the, sur the surgeon would hate it. Yeah? It's, it's a big machine and it's there and it's on the way and it's a bit his enemy. Yeah? Whereas if you have some sort of um, forceps uh, integrated, some force sensor integrated into tools that are more usable by the surgeon, that provide information that is complementary, then this, this, this may be the way also that they, they get into, into using these sort of devices. And maybe, partially, maybe partially related to that is how is it with regulations and things like that? If you come with a device, it's like, what do you need to prove? Do you need to prove accuracy or efficacy? Or where are the things that's going on that you need to take into account? Mm -hmm. so, so there is, of course, a, a big continuum of, of, of in terms of what you promise, right? So you can promise a planning system and just say, OK, I'm just showing the information that is anyway in the image in a different way. So then you don't need so much regulation. Or you can do planning system where you are telling the surgeon what to do, and then you need regulation. Or you can actually act on the surgery with a, with a robot, in which case the regulations are, are very, very uh, tricky. And, and that's, of course, one of the big hurdles for the systems. Very, very interesting. Um, I would like to know your opinion about the new kind of 3D uh, visualization systems with the glasses and the uh, Oculus Rift, et cetera. And how you see this integrated with the robots in the surgical planning, etc. Well, you know, it's it's a bit um, everything old comes back, yeah. Now, now is now is uh, neural networks, yeah, and, and mainframes and uh, all these things that were past, yeah. Now they come back. It's, it's the same with music, yeah. I mean, every like thirty years you get the revival of of music. Um, so, for example, you, you've seen some things on augmented reality. And this, um, this is very much researchy work, but actually the, the, the technology of, of the commercial companies has overtaken this. So you, now you have your mobile phone and it gives you augmented reality. And I think the same is going to happen with virtual reality in a sense. So still the, the, the use of like glasses, Oculus Rifts and all that in a, in a surgical environment it has been tried many times and it's not, it's not a, a way forward. I mean, you, you cannot ask the surgeon to have this big glasses, yeah? 
uh, at least in the operation room, maybe for planning is, is different. Yeah? Um, and it's a bit the same with, with virtual reality. I think, I think we are in a stage in which it can really happen, finally. I mean, it comes back every like five, ten years, yeah, virtual reality. Um, so I, I think, I think this, this is going to change quite a lot of things. So, so all, these, all these interfaces, I think, are finally moving forward. But because companies are pushing them for the general public in like mobile uh, apps and things like this. Yeah. And, and as a research community, I think we, we need to be very careful um, in terms of monitoring what the companies are offering as well. Yeah. Because I see that, for example, in terms of um, image analysis for cardiac, where actually companies are, are doing better <laughs> than the research community. So, okay, something has happened. Yeah, maybe we should wake up and think of new things to, to, to offer them. Yeah? So I think it's the same a bit with visualization uh, tools. Okay, thank you very much. So a last thing.